Thank you. Um, André, I don't thank you, because now I suppose everybody will, be ten, will tend to sleep. So uh, I don't have as many interesting graphs as André, but I do have a game for you. Beware. There's an element in this talk, my talk, that's common to André's talk. If you find it, you win the game. So I hope it will keep you alive and kicking during the presentation. So yes, I'm going to talk um, about upstream issue from yours. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. What's behind? Manual annotation, human annotation. We all agree that it's complex. We all agree that it's not, it's expensive. So I'll go deeper into that to show you um, what I've been working on on that subject. So what do, uh, why do we use um, annotated corpora in natural language processing in the first place? Well, we use them for two reasons. First, we use them to train our models. That's the upper part of the graph. And we, use, use, we also use them, of course, to evaluate the model from which we derive quality metrics. Okay? Um, it's been that since the explosion of the statistic, statistical methods in NLP uh, 20 years ago, I'd say. But we do use them for other things like linguistic um, um, studies on text and so on. And it's notoriously costly. So it's difficult to find costs on um, all the um, annotation campaigns, but there are some um, evidence. For example, for the pen tree bank, um, there were something like 5 million tokens that were annotated with part of speech and 3 million annotated in syntax. And so they say this, it, it took people uh, a learning phase of one month to reach 3,000 words an hour and so on. So we don't have the exact number of dollars. They don't have the amount it costs, but we have an idea. It's huge. For the Prague dependency treatment, we do have something. We, we know it's $600,000. $600,000. It's something. I mean, it's huge. It's costly. And even in the biomedical bio domain, it's, it's quite costly. We all, you all know uh, Genia, and it's uh, quite costly too. And I just had the data from uh, Kevin for Kraft. So it's approximately, approximately, approximately uh, 450 um, thousand uh, dollars just for the annotation part. Okay, so it's a huge amount of money. We all ask for money for annotation. It's huge. How do we do? How can we make it less expensive? Okay, how can we produce more data that's uh, manually annotated? We need that. We need annotated data quality annotated data. One solution is to use, well, the crowd. So that's what I did and that's what I'm going to show you. So this is my view, one view on crowdsourcing. There are many other views. I just put a reference here of all sorts of taxonomies you can find, taxonomies you can find on the subject. My view is, is it benevolent, uh, remunerated, is it direct, do you see what you're doing or not? So, the well-known examples, Wikipedia, the Gutenberg project, uh, that's the distributed proofreader part. So it's benevolent and direct. You know what you're doing when you participate in right? With games with a purpose, you're benevolent, but you're... Well, sometimes you know what you're doing because you are looking... Well, you know because you looked for it, but if you don't look for it, well, it's only a game. And another type of crowdsourcing, Amazon Mechanical Turk, it's remunerated, although very, the salaries are very low, it's remunerated, and it's direct, in, direct. You know what you're doing, you're working on the subject. Maybe you don't have the whole picture, but at least you know what you're doing. And I'm going to focus on games. Mainly, well, I won't say that, but mainly because it's an ethical way of doing crowdsourcing. So, games have been around for a while now in NLP. Um, Mathieu Laforcat did created June Moore, I think, in 2006. And the first paper dates from 2008 in English. 
So, what's doing, uh, what is it doing? It's using the knowledge of the crowd, the knowledge of a speaker of the language. So, it's a game where you uh, play associating ideas. The platform is asking you to associate something to quality, for example. And then you enter words, terms, associate, you think, to quality. Your answers are compared to a, another player's answer, and if you have answers in common, they are added to the network and you gain points. The most uncommon they are, the most points you gain. So that's how the network grows bigger and bigger. Yeah, because you're creating, while you're playing, you're creating a lexical network. And the relations are typed. Now, at the moment, there are more than 10 million relations that were, that have been created in Jumbo. And the very interesting part in that kind of game is that the resource is not static. It's dynamic. It always evolves. Because a number of players evolve, they're still playing. And they are new terms and uh, new name entities. So we can, we can model the world as it is for the players at the moment they're playing. If there's a new actor, um, a new um, movie, it will appear in the game very soon. We can also use the basic education of the crowd, what they learn at school. That's what they do in Fred Detective. You play detective, you're finding the anaphore. So basically what it does, it, it helps you uh, annotate co-reference relations. It's not really a uh, game, I'd say. It's more of a gamification of a, of a task, but it's, well, it works. I've been very addicted to Fred Detective, for example, so it works. And they have updated more than uh, uh, 200,000 words like this. So what they did is that they trained people simply. Okay, because it's not obvious what an anaphore is for somebody who has never done that. So they, play, they, they train you, then you, you are able to play any game point. Now another game that's not from the NLP world, that's using the learning cap capabilities of the crowd, which are huge. It's folded. Maybe you know it. So, does somebody know about Folded? You, were play, you played it? Okay, so it's a beautiful game because it's 3D and you manipulate proteins, basically. What you do is you uh, solve scientific issues by playing in 3D. And you fold proteins. So, they found a solution to the crystal structure of a monometric retroviral proteins. That's, that was um, an issue unsolved for more than a decade, and it was solved in a couple of weeks by a team of players. So yes, it works. They were not specialists. Okay? They played without any prior knowledge in biochemistry. And they solved an issue that's very complex. They did it step by step. So, in it, you you're trained. You have tutorials, you cannot go and, you know, work on a puzzle as long as you need to be good enough to have enough points so that you can get a new puzzle that's more complex and so on and so forth. And some people get very, very, very good at it. It's not my case. But, okay, I found it very complex, I was not interested, I gave up. But some people did play a lot on that. And, well, what we did is we tried to use the learning capabilities of the crowd and to have people annotate dependency syntax relations. That's no fun. I mean, it's not school syntax, it's linguist syntax. So it, you have to really follow the rules and they are not so easy. So we decided, well, let's try and see if uh, the crowd can learn that. So we're just finalizing the uh, version 1. We decompose the task by phenomenon, so that people can learn uh, one phenomenon, annotate one phenomenon, and then annotate another one, and not annotate the whole sentence. We have tutorials, of course, and we uh, regularly propose reference uh, sentences. So that's ongoing work. We expect that to work. It it's already, we, the, pro, the first results are very promising. So 
They're not going beyond legends. So that's a promising solution. Because players like, they love, they love to follow rules. It's, there are various types of players, I won't go into that details, but most of them love to, to, to know all the rules of your game and they love to follow the rules, they love to um, um, bypass the rules. Well, they love rules. And that's why it works great. It's massive, it's quick, it's low cost, although you have to develop the game, it takes time, it takes money, but it, it, it is not comparable to the price of a whole annotated corpus. The, pro the production, well, we don't know. We don't know what are the limits of what can be produced with the crowd. And we can, you can create, what you create is dynamic. That's very interesting for an LP because we, we have new words coming in all the time. But it's still little study, so you have to deconstruct them. You, okay, you won. <laughs> no, you can say that's okay. You have to evaluate the quality of the produced resources. That's not that easy. And what's important is to identify what's complex in your notation uh, campaign so that you can put it in a game, to decompose the complexity, yeah, to put, be able to put it in a game. So in fact, for me, um, games with a purpose are like a magnifying glass on what I'm really interested in, that is manual annotation, because what's important, that is, knowing what the complexity is and being, being able, able, able to evaluate uh, the quality that you obtain is what's so important in games. Okay? Because if you're not able to evaluate the quality in games, you will produce crap. And if you are not able to decompose the complexity of your task, you will never be able to have people play and do it. Okay? So let's have a closer look at this crowd. So this is the crowd for a uh, French detective. I'm not sure I'll be able to... This one? Okay. So you see, it's not a crowd. You have the number of points per player and you see that about 30 people produced the resource. 13 people is not a crowd for me. Among those 13 people, some of them were students uh, of linguistics, but some of them are complete unknown people. There are not so many of them. Among the 2,000 players that played during that period, you had only 13 people that produced the main part of the resource. The rest is important too. We need the long tail, but the biggest part is from 13 people. This is from Jojo, so I will not repeat, but it's exactly the same kind of a parallel curve. And this is our game, Zombelingo. And um, as you can see, a small number of players are producing the annotations. Again. So it's not a crowd. So when I hear people saying, okay, crowdsourcing is about having non-expert producing uh, annotations, well, it's not. For two reasons. First, it's not a crowd, as I said, and it's not about using non-experts. It's about finding and training experts in the crowd, but not experts of the domain. They are experts of the task. Okay, people who play folded are great at folding proteins. They are experts of putting folding in 3D. People who play on bilingo are experts of annotating. Um, uh, sentence, uh, syntax dependencies uh, according to Anna Bailey's laws in the game. People playing Jumbo are experts of Jumbo. Okay, it's a task, and they are experts of this task. And it works fine to me. The question is quality, data quality. Because they're experts, they play, what do they produce? I mean, the experts of the task because they produce data quality. The question is, how do you design your game so that people create quality data? What's important is to keep in mind the virtuous circle. You gain point if you produce quality. That's not that easy. 
In Zoglino, we have a nice feature that we found very fun, is that you have the sentence disappearing while you're playing. So you're trying to play, and suddenly your sentence disappears. And you need to have a special object, classes, and so on, to be able to see it. Well, the player's surprised, that's fun, but then, when it is or she is surprised, they tend to click anywhere, and it creates crap, crappy relations. Things that are, we don't want in our, in, our, in our notation. So we have to remove it. Another interesting effect was in Jumbo. A player found a hack in the code to be able to get more time to play. So what he did was playing longer, for longer, and he created more good data. So Mathieu wanted to keep it in the game, but other players didn't want him to be in the game because they were, I mean, they were envious, they were angry at him, so well, Mathieu had to ban the guy from the game, although he was creating great resources. So you see, it's not, it's not that easy. Okay? You have to keep that in mind all the time while creating your funny functional features. So how do we evaluate the quality? First, you can use, of course, a reference. That's what they did in um, Presentative. So they obtained an, um, an internet data agreement from 0.7 to 0.8, which is not bad for uh, reference, I suppose. We'll talk about that later. But they completely failed that there was a part of the game that was about adding, uh, identifying properties, what they call properties. That is, John is a postman. John the postman. Nobody was able to do that. Zero <laughs> internet data agreements. So part of the game was a failure. For Jean it was tricky because there's no real reference. Okay, you, you could say, okay, Babelnet could be a reference, Wordnet could be a reference, but they are very different from Jean uh, in what's created. Well, I'll go into details if you want later. So what Mathieu did was creating a, another game to validate the resource. So this other game, that Totaki, uh, you can you think of a word. You give clues to the uh, sorcerer, and after whatever it is, and after a while, he, he, he can guess what the word, what word, which word he had in mind. Okay, so that's to validate the resource. So now back to the real world. Everybody's sleeping again. Um, I talk about this evaluation that we all have in mind. Okay, how do you? Annotating is about interpreting. People interpret. How, how do you uh, evaluate that? Well, you can only measure the consistency of the annotation. You all know that. We uh, use the interannotator agreements, and for example, the weather, kappa. So some said uh, I had a good interannotator agreement. Let's say I had a 0.67 or 0.7. Well, what does it mean exactly? Is it good? Depends on when you consider the question, okay? In 77, it was substantial. Uh, after Krippendorf, it was considered tentative. And after a while, it was good. And then you have Einstein and Poesio telling you that you need to be at 0.8 to be a good internal digital agreement. In fact, we don't know. We don't know what we're saying when we say at 0.8. We don't know that. So what we did with a, a group uh, I worked in with Pierre was to uh, try and give some meaning to, to these evaluate obtained results. So, so uh, some among us created a tool uh, in which you put a reference annotation and then you shape this reference annotation with a magnitude like the earthquake we had on Monday. Okay, we you shake it and you control the earthquake. After that, you apply your measures, and you see how they, how they react to the magnitude of the evolution. That can give something like that. So this, uh, this was part of speech annotation on um, <coughs> French speech. And you can see that the reactions of coins kappa, the weighted kappa. So weighted kappa according to the types of types. If you made an error in on types, it was considered more serious than on subtypes. And observed agreement. And what you see is that uh, the weighted kappa reacts in a more regular way as compared to the coins kappa, or obviously to the observed agreement. It's just to show what we can do with this tool. Okay, we just started doing that, and 
I think there will be more. It's an open source tool, if you want to use it, go ahead. So, now that we have an idea of what we obtain as quality, what's difficult? I mean, there are so many variations of annotation campaigns, you have part of speech tagging, you have gene name relations, uh, renaming relations to identify, or even structured name entities. Those are very different annotation campaigns. How can you say it's complex, not complex? It's like a, a ball of pool. When you're starting to pull a string, you never know what comes from where. It's very difficult to identify various dimensions. So, there's, although there has been a, a growing interest in the community from large scale, large scale campaign, good practice from uh, corpus linguistics formats with uh, LAF, with Nancy I, the organization of campaigns, evaluation, partial methodologies also. There's been a tutorial by Ed Orvey in 2010, agile annotation methodologies, which you may have heard of. Uh, matter from Pustajowski and Stubbs, and also some insight from uh, cognitive science. Tomanek did a very interesting experiment on annotation. Okay, but still, we still don't know what's complex exactly. We have ideas about what's going on there, but what can you say? So I worked on that with uh, Adeline Nazarenko and Sophie Rosset. And we used our, exper our various uh, experiments on annotation. We did a lot of annotation, in particular in the Poirot project. And we identified, after a lot of um, work on that, uh, six dimensions of complexity. Five of them are completely independent, so you sh really should take them into account separately from the others. And the last one is the context, and it's not independent. Okay, many of the five other relations depend on the context too. So two of these dimensions are related to the localization of the annotations. Where, where are they? Where should I annotate? And three others are related to the characterization of the annotation. What kind of note should I put on them? We decided to put that from, um, to, to create a scale from zero, zero complexity to one, maximum complexity just to allow for a rough comparison. Keep in mind that it's rough. It's to give you an idea ahead of your campaign on what will be difficult. Where should I put my, um, my efforts to put tools? You know, you need tools to annotate, tools to help. Where should I put them? What is going to be difficult? Obviously, this is independent from the volume to annotate, the number of annotators. This is part of the management of their campaign. So, what to annotate? First, first uh, dimension, discrimination. It's about finding um, the needle in the haystack. Okay? Is it a needle in the haystack or is it easy? The discrimination for the part of speech tagging in the pantry bank is not that complex because you have to annotate everything. But if you're doing a gene renaming relations and you have some, we add something like two um, one, one or two, uh, I think it's two, uh, in average we have two renaming relations per uh, abstract. So that's no need in your head stack, it's not a lot at all, it's difficult to find. So it's more difficult if the units are scattered, okay, in particular if the segmentation is not obvious. So this is this idea that we want to convey here, that the discrimination weight is all the more high as the proportion of what you should annotate as compared to what could be annotated is low. Okay, this is this idea of what can I annotate and what should I annotate. So I won't go into detail, but we need for a reference segmentation for that. So the discrimination for the venture bank is zero. You don't have to look for what to annotate, it's any word in the text, any token. As for the renaming task, is well, close to one, close to very, very difficult. Because you have to find, among all the words in the text, among all the gene names in the text, you have to find the ones that, are into, that, that enter into a renaming relation. Now, the limitation. Once you have found, more or less, the piece that you want to annotate, 
then you want to be sure to undertake only the part that you want to. So that's boundary delimitations. So you can expand, you can shrink, you can decompose, you can group. Sorry. So extending, you found Madame Chirac, but in fact it was Monsieur and Madame Chirac. You have to extend the the, the scope of the segment. You can decompose. Préfet Erignac was in fact Préfet and Erignac. Or you can group together several discriminated units. That's quite easy. This is the usual word error rate type of you know, um, uh, measure. And for the renaming company, it was zero because we were only annotating simple, name, uh, simple tokens for gene names. For the pantry band part of speech, it's also zero because they had not so many multiple expressions. And for the named entities, it was one because we all the time had to move the boundaries of the named entities. Now the expressiveness, now we have to, how to annotate? How do we annotate? How do we do characterize what we put? There are several degrees of expressiveness on the annotation language. We chose arbitrarily, yes, to put 0 0.25, 0 0.5, two type languages, 0.5 to relational languages, or variety two, and then the others are less common, so we basically almost never use them. So it's almost all the time 0.25, because we almost all the time use type language. Now, the dimension of the that of the tax set. This is the tax set for the name, the structure and identity campaign. So you, you, we had quite a number of tags. And what we had in mind is that when your tax set is higher cast, it's less complex than when there are, there's absolutely no hierarchy. Okay, when it's flat, it's more difficult because you have to have more things in mind. So basically what we, well, what we said is that we have to take into account the various levels of a hierarchy when there's one, and this is the case here. So the degree of freedom here is six, or level one, because you have six tags to choose from. Level two is at maximum it would be eight, because for the production type we have um, nine possibilities. Level three, four possibilities. And then, well, we simply add them. And the tax set dimension, well, we, we use a, a toe that's, we put it at 50, but we can change that. You consider the number of tags that you think is, is a lot, and I think 50 is already a lot. Uh, not to mention ontologies, okay, but okay, uh, 50 is already a lot. And what we obtain for renaming is close to zero, and for named entities, it's a bit more than that. It's 35, 34. Now the most difficult part, ambiguity, because that's where the human really puts his uh, interpretation, okay? What we can do is using the traces left by the annotators, and that's very important. Okay, you said that for craft was an issue, you know, the annotators didn't, could not say they didn't agree, or well, they didn't know. You really have to uh, give the annotators the possibility to say, I'm uncertain, I don't know. And potentially to tell them to put a type of ambiguity, of uncertainty. So that's what we did for the G renaming uh, campaign. And we had uh, residual ambiguity that's interesting, and that's, that was very close to zero because one of uh, the annotators didn't get it, they didn't use it, never. That's too bad. So it doesn't apply to pen trigger because there are no traces left. Another kind of ambiguity that could be computed is the theoretical ambiguity. That's when you have already some kind of a, a sample that you can use, uh, or another campaign that you can use to compare, for example, uh, the ambiguity of the vocabulary in the pen tree bank and you can compute then uh, the ambiguity of a potential other campaign. So that's basically uh, the ambiguity of the, the, the number of times it takes the various annotation and the frequencies of that. It doesn't apply to remaining relations uh, because we, we didn't have the, the data for that. So that's the part where it's difficult. Okay, it's difficult to have something to rely on. Easier the context. So there are to my view, yeah, there are at least two types of contexts. The first one is the size of the window you take into account, so it's usually the sentence for part of speech, but it could be much more. 
for the football annotation campaign, we had the, the context we needed was the text, the whole text. So that's what you see uh, here. And the number of knowledge elements. So when you have only the annotation guidelines to take it to account, it's not the same as you have the annotation guidelines, some kind of uh, nomenclature like Swiss prod or whatever you're using, uh, or an ontology. Uh, or maybe you have new source to take into account, and they are not taken into account in the guidelines that you gave your annotators. That will take time. So that's our result is a mix of the two. Okay, you, you need to take into account the context, the context size, and the accessibility of the knowledge. And if you tell the annotators you should use that, 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 it takes like, them less time, it's less complex for them to go and search for information. So, once you've done that, you have something that I call the complexity profile of the, of the campaign. Again, it's rough. It doesn't have to be very precise. You compute all the dimensions, either from a sample of what you've done or a similar campaign. And it gives you an idea, just an idea, of what will be difficult, what will be complex in this campaign. So we, we put that on a radar, um, and what we see is that for the genome naming relations, what was very, very difficult is the context and the discrimination. The rest was pretty easy, okay? For the name identity campaign, it was less obvious, but there are a number of things we could have helped people with. For example, delimitation and discrimination, well, probably we should have pre-annotated the corpus, which we did not. Okay, if you pre-annotate, then you have less discrimination, less delimitation to, to take into account. Also, for the context, we could have put some more information in the guidelines about the context to take into account. That would have helped. So this helps in advance. When you're preparing your campaign, it helps you see what's going. It's just like a um, validation or something that you, you go with. Now, machine and manual annotation. I did some experiments. Uh, with Benoit Sago on the influence of pre-annotation, because, well, it's usually useful, you gain a lot of time. So what we wanted to know is that, is there a bias? It, is it useful? And is there, to which point it's useful uh, according to the quality of the tool you use to pre-annotate, okay? So what we did is we, basically, we, we trained various uh, part of speech tigers, state-of-the-art part of speech tiger. We, like a number of, uh, you know, different quality, progressively, ten, with 10 sentences, 20 sentences, 50 sentences, and so on. And then we apply that on the corpus and we tested uh, the annotation, the correction of the annotation, in time and quality. So you see the correction time is divided by two. But what's very surprising is that it's divided by two only with uh, a tool that's been trained on 50 sentences. 50 sentences, a, a tool that's really bad. I think the, 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 accur uh, the, the, the accuracy of the tool was something like 69, 67, 69%. It helped, uh, it helped the annotators, and they, it helped them gain uh, half of the time. I mean, they, it took them uh, half of the time to, to correct that, as compared to annotation from scratch. So it's worth the, it's worth the to, to train even a bad tiger helps a lot. As far as correction and uh, as the quality is concerned, it was rather flat, it didn't change a lot. So it, it's not, it doesn't really impact the quality of what you're doing. We did notice a bias, uh, but uh, it was small enough not to, uh, I mean, you should consider it, you should put that in the guidelines, be where it's been pre-annotated and so on, but it's not meaningful enough so that it doesn't invalidate the hypothesis. So, well, this is the kind of tool you can put uh, to a pre-annotate. Well, this is my conclusion. Um, graphs for me, I told you, is a, are like a magnifying glass on manual annotation. So it's very promising uh, for language resources creation, but it's more interestingly, it's, it helps understanding better the language resources creation process. It helps you, it forces you to decompose the complexity so that you have to know what is the complexity of your campaign. And it shows you 
uh, interesting um, effects on what's an expert, what is not an expert. And it's also interesting that it's well, rather ethical because if you don't pay people, they only play if they're benevolent to play. Okay, there's no uh, problem with that with me, at least. What we don't really know yet is that can you do complex, very complex things like syntactic annotations? I think we uh, will know in the coming weeks, and it seems yes, you can. Yes. Uh, my question after a week here is, can we do biomedical annotations? And I think we can. Uh, there might be interesting uh, experiments to, 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 let, to lead on that, but I'm pretty sure we can. But the fact is that creating a good game requires talent, and there's no such thing as a checklist of what you should do to create a good game. So it still requires some research to define that better. And obviously, quality evaluation remains an issue for the games, like for all the rest of the campaign we're leading. Okay, it's always an issue. The next step uh, for me, especially in France, is to generalize citizen science. So we will generalize on Bilingo. We have a new version. Um, we want to validate the process. And we will apply it to other languages, especially for, uh, to English and German. Not that English do does need resources, but it's because we want to have uh, some visibility, obviously. But also we want to apply that to less resource languages. Not all, but those who um, have a number of um, uh, native speakers on the internet. That's the case for Britain, for example, in France. And what's more importantly, we want to develop with people from the Institut des Systèmes Complexes and the Museum uh, d'Histoire Naturelle, we want to create a platform for, this, for citizen science in France. So that all the researchers are able to, even if they don't know how to develop a game, they can you know, access the platform and say, I would like to have a voting game, which is, which is very easy to create, created on that subject. And then the platform helps them do that, or even if, you, if we can mutualize the funds, we can have somebody, an engineer working there, helping creating games. And also, the gamers are, you know, they are a community, they are managed, managed by the same person, and they can go from one game to the other, still participating to science. A lot of people are willing to participate to science now, and I think we should really help them help us. So that's what we're trying to do at a time where funding is really getting more and more difficult to obtain. I think this is quite interesting. Thank you. <laughs>